mention tonight is about a little known Portsmouth resident, Sarah J. Eddy. And to tell us about what they've discovered about her is Gloria Schmidt and Marjorie Webster from the Portsmouth Historical Society. Good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this presentation and tell you that we have a warning to give you. Marge and I have uh, grown to love Sarah as we have researched her. So um, we, are, we are going to sing her praises this evening. And um, what we can tell you is actually just a little bit, just kind of the tip of the iceberg of what we have gathered uh, about Sarah. But um, we're opening this as a, as a way of introducing Sarah to you if you don't know it, no, don't know her. And, and um, we just kind of like to, to share a little bit about her and we'll continue our research, I'm sure. And we're hoping that we keep it within the hour. Yes. <laughs> because we tend to overflow on her praises. Yes. First, I want to tell you how we began discovering Sarah. Um, Marge is our curator at the Historical Society, and I'm on the curator's committee. And every year in the fall, we generally look around and decide on a theme for the next year. And we decided last fall that it was going to be lost in time, or lost to time. The idea of what was around 100 years ago that's not around now. And what we do is we kind of go around our collection and we kind of look at what might um, work in this, what might be good for display. And one of the things that we came to was uh, a painting that has been in the back of the Historical Society ever since we've been there. We've been there. And I, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to this painting. It really it needs repair, it needs cleaning, but we knew a few things about it. We knew that it was someone called Grandma Burke. We knew that it was, had something to do with the social studio. We knew that it was concerned with a Bristol Ferry artist colony, and we knew that the artist was Sarah J. Eddy. So this is where we kind of started. Marge and I go away. Go ahead. Marge and I go away over the winter. So we do a lot of research while we're gone. One of my hobbies is collecting vintage images of Portsmouth. So all of a sudden on eBay, I begin to see these social studio postcards. So I began to collect social studio postcards. And it's, it's just really very interesting. Um, I'm a librarian. I tend to do research. I, I'm pretty good online. Marge is really good with genealogical research. So we kind of complement each other when we do our research. So I was finding articles on, in Good Housekeeping, 1906, on this social studio. And the more I read about it, the more interesting it seemed. But who was Sarah? We just had no idea when we first started who Sarah might be. Hi, Mom. <laughs> who is Sarah? Well, Sarah was born. Oh, well, I, oh. I've stepped a little bit further. Oh. <laughs> All right. Sorry. <laughs> so one of the, the interesting things that happened to us was that when we began to research Sarah, we came in contact with other people that were researching Sarah at the same time. Online, I found one called Lisa Struckmeyer, and she was working on this Frederick Douglass painting. Another is Joanna Doherty, who's with us tonight, who's researching Sarah's house. She's with the Rhode Island Historic Preservation. And we were all researching Sarah for different reasons. But the marvelous thing was that everybody began to share with everybody else what we had. And we continued to do research, and we added other friends, like Bob Pimentel, here at the library, who became a friend of Sarah as well as he researched her. So now we're going to kind of talk to who is Sarah. Okay. 
Uh, Sarah was born in Boston uh, in 1851 to James Eddy. James Eddy was from Providence. Her mother was Eliza Jackson, and she was from Boston. Uh, Sarah lived, as you saw in the opening slide, at 567 Bristol Ferry Road. She began her residence there. We don't have an exact date. We feel as though she probably came here summers because Barton Ballou from Providence Jewelry was down here. And, but we know that Sarah built her home in the late 1890s on Bristol Ferry Road. She died as a single woman in 1945. She was 93 years old, and she died in her home. She owned much property in Portsmouth. From Mount Hope Bay, her property extended up from the bay, up to Bristol Ferry Road, and that portion of her property included the parcel where her social studio was. And then it crossed Bristol Ferry Road, and that's where her residence was, and her property actually extended down to, I'll do it in Rhode Island terms, no, the opposite of Rhode Island terms. <laughs> what is now there today is Boyd's uh, farm stand. So it extended to Founders Brook. She also owned what is now the Connors Funeral Home, and at that time it was the Willow Brook Farm. She used that, um, that piece of property as a guest house for her overflowing guests, and some stayed at not just a weekend, <laughs> like years. <laughs> um, she, had, she had brothers. Uh, she had Benjamin and James, and both these brothers died when Sarah was two years old. One was younger than her, one older than her. She also had a sister, Amy. Amy lived to adulthood and married Dr. Edward M. Harris and lived in California. Sarah visited her often, but um, Sarah outlived Amy as well, so all her siblings were gone. She also had uh, three half-siblings because her mother was married briefly for about nine years before her first husband died. So Eliza Jackson was married to Charles Merriam. He died, and the, um, that union had produced three children, two boys and a girl, and they all predeceased Sarah. So Sarah was not really by herself, you'll say. Um, we have not yet found a birth certificate, and we're talking with all the people who were researching that we mentioned earlier, unless Joanna has new news. <laughs> okay, no new news. We have searched everywhere that this family lived because uh, one brother was born in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and they were up in Bar Harbor, Maine, and of course Providence and Boston, and we have found no birth certificate, even though we spell it every single way we can think of to find it and do every kind of clever search, but we haven't found a birth certificate. We, did, we do have her will, which it was probated here in Portsmouth. Um, the, the information that we have for, on Sarah is taken from family histories and a passport and this one photo that exists. Sarah, as Gloria reminds me, because she's a photographer as well, was always on the other end of the camera. She, um, she was the one taking the pictures. She did it, her, when I get into her family, you'll find that they didn't want a lot of attention drawn to themselves. They wanted attention for their causes. And so this one was unearthed by Lisa Struckmeyer. That's right. Who was uh, researching the um, Frederick Douglass painting. And um, it belongs to the Rhode Island Humane Society, which is one of Sarah's causes, but we'll hold that for later. But this is the only uh, photograph we know. She was a tiny little woman. Her passport describes her, and this passport was issued a month and a half after her father's death. Her, her mother had died before that. Um, so in 1888, at age 37, she was described as five feet, one and a quarter inches, and just this week I found out that her mother was a quarter of an inch shorter than her. Um, she had um, medium nose, medium mouth, <laughs> a lot of mediums, a light <laughs> complexion, oval face, but she did have a pointed chin, is how they described her in her passport, dark brown hair, and uh, brown eyes. Uh, okay. The, there, uh, the other question that came up was, what was Sarah J. Eddy's middle name? 
Now, um, her passport just lists it as J. But when we went into family histories, and the family was very involved in these histories, the, the, the Eddie reunions would be in Providence, and her father had notations in books, and that indicates that her name was James. Many, many sources, especially when her anything is posted about her work, will call it Jane. But we think more likely James, because that was in the family history. And also, James was a family name uh, that was her, um, on the paternal side, that was her grandmother's family name. Last name was James. Uh, let's see what else. OK, she, uh, back to, she never wanted any commotion about her. Even we found an obituary. It was very, very brief. And it said as little, and her will noted as little as possible was to be done when after she died, just bury her, cremate her, and bury her. And she was cremated in Boston, and because Swan Point didn't have a crematorium at the time, and it took a long time to find even a, an inscription of where she was buried, but Joanna, uh, well, I, I think we may have found it, and Joanna did the legwork and walked over to the North Burial Ground in Providence, and in the Eddy plot, with a very nice monument, is a, a, little, a little line for Sarah on the back. Uh, she And one other thing, why we know so little about Sarah, not only did she not take photographs, but she, there was no biography of her. And when asked to submit a biographical sketch when she was displaying her artwork in Paris, of the, it was the exhibition of the women's yeah. photographic, um, I don't know if a group, a yeah. group. <laughs> she was asked to submit a, a brief, a biographical sketch for the brochure, and she kind of poo-pooed that and said, oh, really can't do that. I don't have time. I, I'd have time to accomplish nothing else if I ran around basically tooting her own horn. <laughs> um, okay, next one, Richard. Okay, her family. Sarah's family is very, very interesting. This is where she gets her values from and her causes. She was born into a family of means with a strong social and humanitarian conscience. Her family championed enlightened, progressive causes. Uh, we'll explore each of these causes separately, but they include anti-slavery, free religious thought, women's rights and suffrage, prison reform, cultural education, and animal protection. These causes were seen as radical and very unpopular in, in the time. And some of these causes today are popular <laughs> in certain places. Um, Sarah and her family supported these both financially and with activism. And later, you'll see how her art reflects on these causes. And while always at the forefront, the family didn't seek attention for themselves. And their financial support, which was hefty, was often given anonymously, and we only learned of it after the person's death. Uh, family activism, some examples. Her grandfather, Francis Jackson, was a leader in the anti-slavery movement. He was very friendly with uh, Garrison, uh, the editor of The Liberator. And um, that was up in Boston, but of course extended nationwide. As an outgrowth of this, he became involved in the suffrage movement, and we've learned that Many of the people who were involved initially with the slavery movement, it's like a three-pronged thing. They became leaders in the temperance movement, women's rights movement, and the anti-slavery movement. They, they go together. Uh, so her grandfather became involved. And one story that we found was that the, um, the women's rights group was looking to assemble in Boston. And we're talking about 1835. And they, the leading citizens of the time, did not want them to assemble. And they made it very clear with, with a violent activity against them. And they had baseball bats, and they would, no way these ladies were assembling in their town. So Francis Jackson went to the group and invited them, please come and meet in my home. And a friend of his said, I don't know that they called him Francis. Maybe they said, Mr. Jackson, what are you thinking? Uh, the, this, that mob is going to destroy your home. 
Have you seen the bats? Have you seen the violence that they are, they're ready to uh, wreak? And he said, my house means nothing if it can't harbor freedom of speech. And he felt strongly about it, as did she. Now, the, her mother, Eliza Jackson Eddy, was a strong supporter of women's rights. And this didn't just mean voting rights. This meant um, property rights for women to be able to own property. It meant freedom for them not to have to do what their husband said. It, uh, and in some circles, this um, it even meant non-marriage, and it, it, it was very extreme in some cases. Um, but Eliza, Eliza was very active in women's rights and also in women's suffrage. And when she died, she left her estate divided equally among two, between two friends of hers, Lucy Stone and Susan B. Anthony. And the, the estate was uh, earmarked to be used to further the cause. Uh, Sarah Eddy's father, James Eddy, was an engraver, an art collector, and he made his livelihood by traveling to Europe. He would buy some works of art for himself, but he also would reproduce the great masters of Europe, and that was for the mass market in America. There was a big market for that at the time. Uh, he placed a very high value on spiritual and moral truth. He built the Bell Street Chapel in Providence, Rhode Island, for the religious, for the, let me get it right, the Free Religious Society of Providence. And this was built at the entrance to his mansion. The organization advocated for individual conscience and um, reason rather than for organized religious thought. Uh, it was a misunderstood philosophy by many. Many thought he was an atheist, but he wasn't. He believed in God, but he thought that your own moral compass, doing what was right, should be your guide rather than a religious group telling you what was right. Mr. Eddy was also involved in the anti-slavery movement, temperance reform, and improvement of women's status in society. So you see her family, prized cultural and intellectual pursuits, freedom of speech, tolerance, human dignity, kindness, human equality, and personal integrity. And a, a snippet we came across after her grandfather Francis's death was that they, uh, it was said that while many would criticize the causes that he advocated, but no one could ever assail his personal character. And I think we could say that was true of Sarah as well. Uh, Miss Eddy continued to follow her, her family's social and philanthropic example throughout her life. She was influenced by her family's values, and that in turn influenced her causes, and that in turn influenced her art. art. Therefore, glory around her yeah. art. Her art was her passion, and she was... Uh, professionally trained or, or, or uh, academically trained at the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, she was a painter throughout her life. If uh, uh, she had a, uh, the uh, tax rolls, the, the census in Providence listed her occupation as a, a painter of, of pictures. And she was a pioneering woman photographer in, in a day when photography was just beginning. And she was uh, very, um, she, she was uh, shown in, in uh, art shows in, in Paris and in London and Washington and in and, and, and many, many places. She, her, uh, her art was shown, and there still is uh, some of her photography and collections at, at uh, the Library of Congress and, and many other locations. She didn't just um, do photography, though. She was a person that kind of used all kinds of different mediums. You see some examples here. She, she painted, she sculpted, um, she, she really uh, used uh, art 
in many, many different ways. And she used her art to uh, help her causes. And, and uh, one person had said to us that she was an enabler. She really would encourage others to bloom artistically. The story that this gentleman <coughs> told was that um, Sarah would invite amateur artists and encourage them to come over. They would stay at her house. Um, she would encourage them in their painting. They would go around Portsmouth in their smocks and berets and you know, go out and, and uh, painting. Um, she taught people how to um, use photography. Uh, this, is, this was something that um, was, um, you know, she, she wrote that, I feel that photography is only one of many modes of expression for artistic feeling and that its possibilities in that direction are very great. I care most for photographs of figures, children, and animals especially. So you can see the next page. These are, next slide, these are some examples of some of her favorite subjects. I just received these. I had gone to uh, a collection of um, letters uh, that Sarah had written to a gentleman named John Carr, and they're in the archives at the New York Public Library. And Sarah sent a number of different photographs to him. First of all, because he was interested in using photographs of children for some of his books and some of his uh, pamphlets and literature, but also because they had a real friendship. And so through the years, she sent him quite a number of, of photographs. Now, the photographs that I looked at being a photographer myself, I can tell you that none of them were like the finished photo. They were kind of like what Richard and I call also rands. They're the ones that as we're perfecting what the finished picture, uh, you know, image is going to look like, these are some things that are printed along the way. So they weren't perfect photos and they weren't wonderful, but I loved a lot of the images. Um, you can see that Sarah liked to dress um, people up. The, the, the little girl there is kind of dressed like a girl from Holland. You know, you, you, you have a, you know, the, the, the cap on and et cetera. That's, that was not a costume of the day and, and feeding the geese. And um, this study of this uh, woman um, just sitting there and knitting, Sarah had a lot of... Um, really common household images. She would have somebody in the kitchen. She would have somebody just outside. Um, these, were, these were some things that, that she really liked to do. Um, that little boy she, she wrote about to, um, to Mr. Carr, and he says, the boy with the cornstalks is little Frankie who lives on the place. I am planning to paint him with his red cap and a bright smile holding Christmas holly leaves. So she, she photographed a lot of the, uh, the subjects that she later wanted to sit down and paint. Can I just sure. Um, the, the genealogist in me has discovered that Frankie is actually Frankie Esteban, who had a military career. And his sister Mary Esquivel, you may know as Mary Monk, the teacher in Portsmouth. Yeah. So that's her, that's Mary Monk's brother, Frankie. <laughs> so as we look at Sarah's images, we find a lot of our neighbors, um, a lot of, uh, you know, the children of yesteryear in, in Portsmouth in, in a lot of the photos. She would drape people. Um, she had a very soft look not a sharp focus to a lot of the early paintings. It was, a, it was a style where it really resembled more of a painting than a, a photograph. And, you know, I just love this one with the woman just deeply in thought, just kind of, of, of sitting there. But these were the kind of subjects that she, you know, that she really uh, in, enjoyed, um, enjoyed doing. So, um, she did her own um, printing 
uh, which in that day was not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing for us to do now. We do black and white photography. But um, in, in order for her to, to do this, we've seen some of her negatives. She has the 8 by 10 glass plates. And um, they're, I'm sure that they're in a lot of households. Um, there are in some in Portsmouth that we'd love to, to get an image of. And you'll see a couple of them later on. Okay. Uh, now to begin the section of our talk on her causes. Uh, abolition of slavery. Uh, very likely, Sarah was wrapped by her mother figuratively and literally in the philosophy of the movement. Her mother, Eliza, had purchased this quilt, which is now in a collection in Boston, and she purchased it just before her marriage in, and I have the year here, 1836. Uh, that was one month before she was married to Charles Merriam. And the center of the quilt, and you can picture that Eliza Wood, she, this was in her home, it later was donated by a child, uh, one of her children, to the museum. And the center piece of the quilt, and I'll read the poem, Mother, when around your child you clasp your arms in love, and when with grateful joy you raise your eyes to God above, think of the Negro mother when her child is torn away sold for a little slave. Oh, for that poor mother pray. And that was a quilt in their home. Um, Sarah and to continued the, um, to work for equality. She entertained the elderly over at Bristol Ferry in the, the studio at times, on the lawn of the studio, but also in the lawn on the lawn of her house. And we found newspaper reports from the, the Newport newspapers that say that uh, the numbers of people entertained there. In 1919, she had 160 people there. And this included the Aged Colored Home, that's the title of it, in Providence. Uh, the numbers had diminished in, by 1926. She entertained 80. But she did this for 40 years. She did this as long as she was in Portsmouth. And, um, so the outing would, was a summer outing. It would consist of food and entertainment for the elderly. And, and in the forefront was always included the colored aged home in Providence. Okay, Gloria's going to talk a little about her art collected, connected to the We have summer. just a little picture there. Sarah's stepbrother was part of John Brown's raid. So... Um, Something Marion. Yeah. <laughs> well, I read one report that he, um, we don't know how leading a role he had because he was a frail boy. Maybe he too was 5'1", I don't know. <laughs> but he was a frail boy, so he stayed back at the, was it the Kennedy farm when the raid happened. Okay. I, I'm sure he was guarding the house. <laughs> okay, so... Um, one of the things that I had discovered when I first started to research Sarah was a um, YouTube video that uh, researcher Leah St uh, Lisa Struckmeyer had uh, about this Frederick Douglass portrait. And I was wondering at first, what does Frederick Douglass have to do with Sarah Eddy? And then in, in looking at that video, it was really clear Douglass, and it should be two S's there, Douglas sat for this portrait in, um, in Sarah's home in Providence. So uh, Frederick Douglass was a family friend because of all the abolition uh, uh, connections. And so uh, this particular portrait is now at the um, Frederick Douglass um, home national site. I just saw something where it was being uh, on display in the governor's mansion at, at the, in uh, Maryland for a time. But um, there was a, a mystery because they knew that this painting had stayed in the Douglas household for many, many years, but they also found a picture of W.E.B. Du Bois, who was a, a leading civil rights, um, black rights advocate, um, with it in his home. So Lisa was researching 
um, the situation of well, how you know what happened to this uh, to this, and and what we found was that Sarah would make multiple copies of paintings that she did. She did this all the time, and she did have this particular uh, painting given to uh, um, Douglas for his own personal use. But she retained a copy, and that was in her home in Portsmouth for years and years and years. And W.E.B. Du Bois decided that he would like to have that. He wrote Sarah. Sarah was a very generous person. I can't find any, any example of where Sarah sold any of her paintings. She gave everything away, it seemed to me. And she just gave this full-length portrait of Frederick Douglass to W.E.B. Du Bois, who had it for a while, gave it to his alma mater, and it's missing now. We have no idea where this is now. But Lisa is continuing to uh, research Sarah and is hoping to write a biography of Sarah as a result of, of working on this particular portrait. Laurie's alluded to the size, even that Grandma Burke painting that we have at the museum. It's easily the size of this white panel there. A little it's wider, a full actually. full length. And most of her work seems to be that the portraits seem to be that size. They're very, very large. Okay, uh, women's suffrage, women's rights in suffrage. Uh, she was, Sarah was a longtime member of the National American Women's Suffrage Society. Sarah continued her mother's work, and she lived to see voting rights granted to women uh, in 1920. Uh, the Newport County Suffrage League, which was described in a biography of, I believe, Susan B. Anthony, was described as an influential nerve center of suffrage activity. It began at Bristol Ferry, and it then spread to the other communities on Aquidneck Island, and this this wasn't always a popular cause in the day because as we, we were speaking to the grandson of August Miller and um, of Oscar Miller and um, he reminded us that the two ends of the island had very different uh, entertaining philosophies and philosophies for what, what, how a life should be lived. And the other end of the island, although Mrs. Belmont was active yeah. in the suffrage movement, but there, you'll see many accounts in the newspaper of the day where these society women wanted nothing to do with voting rights. Why, why would you want to vote? <laughs> <laughs> Your place is not there. I guess it's in the, uh, the not the dining room, it would be on the ballroom floor. Um, she, um, and as well as the founding of the society in um, Bristol Ferry, it all, also, when the rights were um, granted to women, they had a jubilee out there. And one account said that it was disbanded there, but then I saw references to it after, so I don't know that it was a total dissolution of the society. Uh, Sarah gave her en energies as well as her art and her finances to the cause. She was consistent and vigilant in this cause as in all her causes. Um, she, one example we have is here in Portsmouth, Sarah protested uh, to the town council that if she was being taxed and didn't have the right to vote, then she was being taxed without representation. And you must remember that Sarah had a considerable amount of property. In 1919, her holdings were valued at $328,000. Now the Vanderbilts lived in town and theirs was a bit more than hers, <laughs> but she was roughly equivalent to uh, Bradford Norman. And you'll remember Bradford Norman uh, was not a poor man. Um, uh, so, but another personal quality of Sarah's was that she didn't hold a grudge. She, you might not think as she did, she might, um, but she was very tolerant. And so we found another report afterward where she turned around and donated furniture to the town hall, despite not being <laughs> represented. <laughs> and it was only a couple of years later on, so it wasn't, That's right, yeah. so, well maybe she was celebrating that she could vote. That's right probably away. true. <laughs> That's probably true. Uh, she had a family connection with Susan B. Anthony. 
And this continued, it continued through letters between the two of them. Um, I have some stuff I'm going to cut if we're getting, are we getting along? Okay, I'll go on with this, okay. One regarded a Miss Ruth Hogarth Dennis, and she was a member of the 1903 graduating class from Rochester University. This was the first graduating class that included women. And Sarah Anthony was also friends with Ruth's uncle, who lived in her guest house for an extended period of time. He was the Reverend Dennis, who was the minister over at the Holy, Holy Trinity? Holy Trinity Church in uh, Tiverton. And um, Susan B. Anthony writes to uh, Sarah, tell Mr. Dennis that his niece Ruth stood ahead of all of the class and above the 200 boys in the college. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think she did graduate like first in her class or something. She was a bright girl. Uh, we may never know the extent of how Sarah nurtured, enabled, and also, we believe, we know she gave a lot of financial backing to individuals in their causes and, and supported a number of people um, for many, many years. But, so we won't know probably the extent of it, but one feels just by her generosity in her will, she provided for uh, her neighbors. Um, I think she financed a few college educations. And, um, uh, Ruth Dennis went on to be a poet, painter, and linguist. Okay. But the big thing was, um, would you read uh, Susan's? Uh, yeah. Oh, coming, yeah. yeah. Susan B. Anthony stayed in Portsmouth. Okay. Um, and she was here for three weeks yes. in order to have her portrait taken. Yes. And uh, this is a letter she writes. She writes, this is a cool, clear Sunday morning, calm, and still, after a gale last night, uh, and she's writing to her sister, by the way, I wish you could see the magnificent view, ocean and islands, hills and autumn foliage. It doesn't seem right for me to be enjoying this without you, and Miss Eddy wants you to come. We have two guests in the house now, Mrs. Mary H. Hunt, just in from the New York Women's Temperance Conference, and Mrs. Mary F. Lovell from the anti vivisection Vivisection Society, and that's like not doing experiments on animals. Um, I was out driving yesterday with Mr. and Mrs. Bolton, the next door neighbors, and they wanted me to go home for, to dinner with them, saying a slice of good roast beef would do me good. Miss Eddie is a strict vegetarian, you know, but I prefer to dine here. Such a good dinner it was. First, dried pea soup made with milk, and then, lo and behold, Slices of roast beef sent in by the Boltons for Miss Eddie's cannibalistic friends. <laughs> uh, we had baked white and sweet potatoes, fresh string beans, and sweet corn that was really sweet. Well, we are known for that yeah. on the island, aren't we? And uh, baked apples with cream for a delicious dessert. And if you'll focus on her home now as I read this section of the letter. Every afternoon, I have the most refreshing sleep, and when I wake, I wake to the slanting rays of, that a, of sun that are shining on Narragansett Bay, and from all the five windows of my big room is the most glorious view imaginable. We have delightful drives over the old stone bridge that connects us with the mainland to Tiverton, and along the shores of the Sconnet River, which is really an arm of the ocean, and here we can see the whole length of the island with Newport and its beauty on the coast. It is 10 miles away, and we went by train one day, took the famous Ocean Drive and passed the palaces of the Nabobs. I went in the carriage one afternoon to call on Julia Ward Howe, whose summer home is six miles from here. She was charming, and I had an interesting time. Now, the um, reason she was right, staying at the house and writing that letter, this was in September of 1901, is, was because she was sitting for her famous portrait, her 80th birthday portrait. It was long overdue because, and we have correspondence between the two saying, oh, I know it's late, I know I've got to get out there, but, but I've been very busy. Her birthday, Susan's birthday, was celebrated in February of 1900 in Washington, D.C. And Sarah, uh, was to paint the painting. So a year and a half later, Susan arrived at the house for the portrait studies. 
And the portrait studies are the smaller vision of the person. Now, Sarah did, we know of two portrait studies that she did. And the portrait studies were done when Susan B. Anthony was at her home for those three and a half weeks. And the intent was that later she would complete the finished paintings. And I'm just going to tell you where those reside today. Um, one study, and that's the smaller one again, is on exhibit at Rochester University. A second, also a study, is at Bryn Mawr. And the larger completed um, portrait, which shows uh, Susan B. Anthony with the roses and the children, is at Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Uh, the portrait shows these roses in the lap. There were 80 roses and 80 children, and there's a little story behind that. The children were evidently lined up, each with a single rose, to present to Susan B. Anthony. And as they approached, Susan's niece, perhaps Lucy, was toward the front of the line, and she just kind of looked at her aunt, waiting for a kiss, and the aunt gave her the peck on the forehead. And after that, Susan B. Anthony felt obliged to kiss every child in the line <laughs> as, she, as she received their rose. Okay, next slide, Richard and Gloria. Yeah. Cultural education was one of, of uh, her passions as well. Um, the social studio uh, was a very special place. And I'm just going to read you a little bit from the postcard. It says, the social studio was erected as a social meeting place for the neighborhood to bring all together for work and recreation, for increased friendly acquaintance and mutual helpfulness. The teaching of kindness to every living creature is made a prominent part of the work. The social studio welcomes everyone over the door, an inscription reads, peace and joy be with all who enter here. And then it's the, the slogan over there is, all men's good be each man's rule, and universal peace shall lie like a shaft of light across the land. So the, uh, the idea was that we had a stake in each other. Um, we had a stake in, in, in um, the, the welfare of each other, uh, kindness towards each other, kindness towards animals, kindness towards everything in nature. And the, that was very much a part of the social studio, but it was also an art center for the town of Portsmouth. And they had, um, it was located in Bristol Ferry, opposite her home. They had, a, 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 I think I can read, it says, a 1905 description was, a large room used for assemblies, one end of which was occupied by a small stage, is furnished simply and artistically. Potted plants, a pianola, a huge open fireplace, oil paintings on the walls, and a good library all lend great charm to the big room, which is a delightful retreat for the young people who flock there from adjoining farms. Lectures, readings, musicals, and social gatherings are frequently held. Classes in pyrography, which is a, a, a sculpture with uh, a carving with, with fire, drawing, watercolor, painting, and raffia. And the basic thought was that it would keep the children busy and away from immature lovemaking, which was, <laughs> <laughs> so, so the social studio was to give them good work, good occupation. They, they had kind of like an arts collaborative uh, where the, the artistic work and the crafts and so forth made could be sold and that um, these young people would be making an income from that as well. So it was, it was just a very special place. And, um, and next. Gloria, it strikes me so much that that quote you read, that's your father's philosophy of yeah. doing, doing good. But that should be each person's role. And you should be listening or looking for the interests of other people and not just your own interests. So philanthropy is uh, very much at the heart of, of everything with Sarah. She had Christmas parties and, and um, with gifts for up to 200 people. I can't imagine trying to organize that today, can you? Um, and she hosted fundraisers and gave to every church in town. She wasn't affiliated with any church, 
But when you look at the, the Newport Mercury clippings, whether it be a Catholic church or a Methodist church or an Episcopalian church, they all came out. She held fundraisers for all of them. Um, as I, you know, the, the, uh, the, the other thing that was really interesting to me was the way she used photography as a way of connecting with people, reaching out to help people. She would especially, she, she, she wrote in, in an article on a good use for a camera, that you know, she would go out to, to areas and um, photograph people. You've got to remember in those days, people could not, uh, you didn't have your digital camera um, to, to have a portrait uh, taken or to have a photograph of yourself was a rare thing. So she would go out and she would be taking pictures of, of children and people and then she would come back with the pictures and talk to them and, and her theory was that, that um, it was a way uh, it, it was a way of, of really getting to know them on a level that she couldn't do any other way. There was a friendship there. There was a, a mutual uh, understanding there. And then if she could help them, she'd go back and figure out what they needed and in her generosity help. So it was her way of reaching out to people. She was... Um, she, she really believed in the healing power of art. And even things as simple, simply as, um, there's a kind of a thing called a, an artoscope or a joy scope. It's, it's kind of, uh, reminds me of a kaleidoscope of some sort. And a lot of the letters she had to this Mr. John Carr were about this. And, she wanted to get it into every mental institution, every um, hospital, every um, correctional facility, uh, prisons, etc. Because her theory was that art was the way of reaching out and, and bringing beauty into their lives. And then that will transform them. There's a transformative power of art. And she really held that. Um, she was generous, generous. Um, with this particular, uh, reading the letters to this John Carr, he had been a fairly wealthy man. He fell on hard times. He had medical concerns. And, you know, they wrote and asked Sarah for money. And she wrote back and she was saying, you know, uh, the depression has hit. I have lost a lot of money. My stocks have done poorly. I have lawyer bills. I can't really do this. I have people that depend on me. And then at the end of the letter, but I can send $10 a month to help. So she was still generous even when she didn't have the resources to be generous anymore. She was generous to the Portsmouth Free Public Library. Uh, if you look at this little room on the side where they have um, a, a little bookshop, that room was put there uh, with funds from Sarah Eddy. And it says, um, there, there was an article that says, the improved, this is 1919. The improvements to the Portsmouth Public Library have been completed and it is now open for use. The walls of both the art room and the library room have been newly painted in two shades of gray, making an attractive background for the new pictures which have been loaned by Miss Sarah J. Eddy of Bristol Ferry, who with Mr. and Mrs. John Eldridge composed the art committee. Miss Eddy gave the art room to the library and from time to time gives a new picture. So this became the children's room later on. But when you look at the size that the library was, that's, that's a... You know, that's half again. And yeah. if anyone knows the story of the fireplace, we understand there's a, fire, a story in there, but nobody remembers it. Yeah. <laughs> nobody remembers the story, but it's, it has beautiful carving and was fairly recently restored, and it's quite gorgeous. But we would love to hear the story. This lady, this little young lady here with her sunbonnet is, is one of uh, Sarah's sculptures, and that's that's downstairs uh, in the children's room normally. 
And these two little figurines um, are there as well, and there's some of Sarah's, Sarah's artwork. And we know that Sarah would normally give to you know, the, the church guild and so forth. So a lot of her work must be tucked somewhere. Ah, humane treatment of animals until her death. This was um, a very important thing. This was something that she lived. She was even uh, a vegetarian. The people that bought her house, the Murphys, uh, mentioned that um, she, she wouldn't even have the lawn mowed because she was afraid that it would kill the crickets. So she was that worried about any kind of, uh, of animal. Um, she was active nationally in the um, American Humane Society. One of the things that she did on this island, um, and, and she did this almost until her death as well, is that she would bring boxes of materials to all the public schools on how to have humane treatment of, of animals. And these were all with her photographs, and, and I'd love to get my hands on a box of, of you know, what Sarah might have brought. Um, she, she called out inhumane treatment as she saw it, and this sometimes did not sit well with neighbors because what they thought of as just trying to manage with their own animals, she saw as inhumane treatment, and she would call out the police. So she, she really, you know, she saw things that she thought were inhumane, and she would, she would call people out on it. Um, she wrote and illustrated books for children. Both of us have copies of two of her books, and you have some in the library as well and Alexander and some other cats, and I have one on friends and helpers about how to treat animals. Um, these books, I, I look at the school library journals, they got excellent reviews in school library journals. So they weren't just, um, uh, just a, you know, a little thing that she put out. They were nationally uh, uh, distributed and in uh, lots and lots of, of uh, libraries. So we're asking, can you see her now? When you go by that house on Bristol Ferry Road, look up at that window and know that Susan B. Anthony spent three and a half weeks of her life. Um, she, didn't, she wasn't quarantined. <laughs> it was the mornings that they painted and then they toured the island in the afternoon. Um, I think she's been with us all along, but we've just been walking past her. Uh, we can see her today in changed attitudes and the uh, the nurtured artist. Uh, she can be seen in tangible things as well. She survives in her books, uh, art, her artwork donated throughout our community, throughout the Quindic Island, but nationally as well. Read of reports of a humane um, society uh, contest for school children, and the award would be one of her paintings. Um, you can um, see the artwork at religious um, guilds on the island. I, I took a trip up to um, Holy Crosses at the church in Middletown. Uh, when their guild hall opened, she donated paintings to them. You couldn't find any, but she did donate them. And St. Mary's, to, uh, evidently there's one of Dahlia's that uh, is still there. Uh, so you can see this in the community. Civic organizations um, received her generosity here at the Portsmouth Public Library. Um, uh, but she left no monuments, to herself anyway. She left monuments to others. She left paintings. She left, uh, um, a, there's a bust of um, Reverend Dennis over at the Trinity Church in Tiverton. She uh, had no children, but she certainly influenced many people's children. Um, she donated the Ellery Street Park in Providence. It was once called the Yeti Park, but her name doesn't remain on much these days. Uh, the children's room here, as I said, cultural education and, uh, and untold financial assistance to others. Um, the Escobars had a fire that burnt their home down. She rebuilt that house. 
so we ask the next slide, Richard. Well, the social studio oh. is still there, by the way. Oh, yes, yes, it is. The social studio is, is now um, a private home, and they've done a beautiful job of restoring it. The great hall that was talked about in that uh, uh, good housekeeping, that's still there with the wonderful fireplace. The and ceiling. Yeah, the vaulted ceiling, and you can really imagine, um, you can imagine Sarah being there. You really can. So uh, what's in your attic? Yes, after, uh, after her death in 1945, there was a yard sale. And when we spoke uh, with Mr. Miller's uh, grandson, said they, and you realize Oscar Miller was a part of that, uh, that artist community. His family was rather upset at the way Sarah's belongings were at times just tossed in the trash. She left her home to the Rhode Island Humane Society to be used as they saw fit. She didn't put any strings attached to how they would use it just for the good of their cause. But the uh, personal things in the home were left to the executor of the will. And I just learned today, it was a relative. We yeah, wondered, yeah. who was Mr. Ryder? Well, it was a relative, her, um, her father, and his grandmother was siblings. And people have been sharing with us things that they have um, from, from uh, Sarah. This was in a glass plate at uh, uh, Duncan Mulkey's home, a uh, really big one. And the two little Ashley girls on this side here. Um, she had a lot of neighborhood children that were in her pictures. Um, we commented on the Ashley girls because our president of our historical society, that one of them is his mother. So uh, um, that's you know, fun for, for, for us. Someone came to the historical society with glass plates or glass uh, slides. And that's a wonderful shot of Bristol Ferry area um, around 1908 or so, which is a wonderful treasure you know, for, for us to have. And this is, this is Marge Wilkie's mother as an infant and her grandmother. And you see that wonderful draping in the mother and child image. Sarah loved that mother and child image so much. These are some more uh, of the pictures that uh, were sent from the New York Public Library. Um, the, the one on the uh, center top there was a, a St. Francis, her depiction of St. Francis, and that won an honorable mention in Washington. And so that was among the pictures. But, you know, some of them I know, some of them I don't know, but these are, these are some, and we invite your questions. Yes, and we want you to search your attics, and yeah. if you belong to any of those guilds, maybe you can get into the, the closet <laughs> and really check it out. Um, but if you have, if you come across any memorabilia, what Gloria and Richard have done is, as things come to the museum, we return them to the family, but we take a, a um, image so yep. that we have it as part of our collection. Um, but we know that there are stories, just as Mr. Miller shared stories of the people running around what's within their smocks and berets. Mm. <laughs> what a sight that must have been. Yeah. <laughs> um,